I'm Kelly, a 43-year-old mother of two, married to Larry, a kind man who's been my support for almost 20 second years. Life's been full of ups and downs, but I've always believed that it's the people with you that make it bearable. That was until my brother Scott decided to take charge. Scott is 10 years younger than me, a whirlwind of bad decisions and wrong priorities. He's the kind of person who thinks the world owes him. Mom always said he'd grow out of it, but at 31 he's still the family's problem. It was a Sunday, the kind that calls for a family gathering at Mom's house. Her house was our safe place, full of childhood memories. As usual, Larry, the kids, and I were there, enjoying Mom's famous roast and her stories from the past. That's when Scott burst in like an unexpected storm. The door slammed against the wall, and he strutted in with a smug smile on his face. He wasn't alone. Clinging to his arm was a young woman, barely out of her teens, with a clearly pregnant belly and a dress more suited for a nightclub than a family lunch. Larry choked on his tea. Lauren, my 13-year-old, asked if she was going to be an aunt. Eric, the 10-year-old, was more interested in why Aunt Olivia's dress was so shiny. Family, meet Olivia, my fiancé, Scott announced, as if he was showing off a prize. Mom's fork dropped, fiancé, Scott, we talked about this, she said. Olivia flipped her hair and gave us a look that could spoil milk. Yeah, we're getting married, and this little guy, she patted her belly, is Scott Jr. The room was so quiet you could hear the clock ticking. Larry cleared his throat. Congratulations, Scott. That's big news, Scott smirked. We're staying here for a while, you know, till we get our own place. Mom tried to smile, but I saw the worry in her eyes. It was like watching someone set up camp at the edge of a cliff. That night, after the kids were in bed, Larry and I talked. Kelly, your brother isn't just irresponsible, he's taking advantage of your mom. I knew he was right. Scott was a tornado, and we were all in his path. The only question was how much damage he would do before he moved on. The next few days were a blur of Scott and Olivia making themselves at home. Olivia turned the living room into her personal lounge, always putting her feet up on mom's antique coffee table. Scott spent his days on his phone, laughing at things no one else found funny. Mom was running around, trying to keep up, making meals, cleaning up after them, and never getting a thank you. It was like watching someone slowly deflate. One evening, I found Mom alone in the kitchen, looking older than her years. Mom, you can't let them walk all over you, I said. She sighed, Kelly, he's my son, and that's my grandbaby. I can't turn them away. I wanted to scream, to tell her she was being used, but I bit my tongue. Family is complicated, and sometimes love means turning a blind eye, even when you know you shouldn't. That's how our new normal began, Scott and Olivia, the ungrateful guests, and the rest of us trying to keep the peace in a house that suddenly felt too small. Little did I know, this was just the calm before the storm. Living with Scott and Olivia turned our lives upside down. Every morning started with Olivia's loud complaints about her backache or cravings. She'd stroll into the kitchen in her pajamas, demanding breakfast like she owned the place. Kelly, make me some of those pancakes, will you? The baby's craving them, she'd say, without even a please. I'd grit my teeth, trying to keep my cool. Sure, Olivia, let me just get Lauren and Eric ready for school first. Scott was no help either. He'd be lounging on the couch, his feet up on the coffee table, glued to his laptop or gaming. Hey, when's breakfast? He'd yell, not even bothering to look up. Mom tried to play peacemaker. Kelly, they're just young. Remember how we were? I wasn't having it. Mom, we never acted like entitled brats, but she just waved me off, scurrying to wait on them hand and foot. Things got worse as Olivia's due date approached. She'd leave a trail of mess wherever she went dishes piled up, laundry forgotten and there she'd be, on the phone gossiping for hours. One day, I snapped. I found her in the living room, her feet once again on the coffee table, talking loudly to a friend. And then I told Scott, we need a new car, 
something safe for the baby, you know? I marched in. Olivia, this isn't a hotel. You can't expect everyone to clean up after you. She rolled her eyes. Chill, Kelly, I'm pregnant, remember? Scott finally spoke up. Kelly, lay off her. Can't you see she's carrying my kid? I shot back. Being pregnant doesn't give you a free pass to be a slob, Scott. Mom came in, wringing her hands. Please, let's not fight. It's not good for the baby. I looked at Mom, her face drawn and tired. This isn't right, Mom. You're wearing yourself out for them. Mom wouldn't listen. Their family, Kelly. What can we do? The days dragged on. Scott and Olivia would disappear for hours, leaving Mom to clean up their mess. They'd return with shopping bags, laughing about their day out. One evening, I heard them planning a lavish wedding. We need the best babe. It's our day, Scott said, his arm around Olivia. Olivia giggled. Of course, and your mom can help with the expenses, right? I couldn't believe my ears. I confronted them. You're planning a wedding you can't afford and expecting mom to pay for it. Scott shrugged. Why not? She's got the money. I was livid. You can't keep using mom like your personal ATM, Scott. My words fell on deaf ears. They just laughed and continued their planning, leaving me fuming. Life in mom's house had gone from bad to unbearable. Olivia had given birth to a baby boy, Jerry. You'd think that would slow them down, but no. It only gave them more excuses. One morning, I walked into the kitchen to find mom washing a mountain of dishes. Olivia was sprawled on the sofa, cooing at Jerry, while Scott played some game on his phone. Morning, mom. Why are you doing all these dishes? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. Mom just sighed. Olivia needs to rest, and Scott's, well, Scott's busy. I glanced at Olivia. Busy doing what? Olivia, you can't just leave everything to mom. Olivia shot me a look. I just had a baby, Kelly. I'm not supposed to stress myself. Scott didn't even look up. Yeah, Kelly, back off. You don't know how hard it is. I couldn't believe it. Hard? You call sitting on your butt all day hard. Mom tried to calm things down. It's okay, Kelly. I don't mind. But I was past caring. No, it's not okay. You're not their servant. It was like talking to a wall. Scott and Olivia just didn't care. They'd leave the house for hours, leaving Mom to take care of Jerry. They'd come back with bags of clothes and gadgets, bragging about their great deals. One day, I found a receipt on the table for a designer dress for Olivia. It cost more than what most people make in a week. I confronted them. Scott, where did you get the money for this? And why is Mom paying for your lifestyle? Scott shrugged, not bothered. She's our mom, Kelly. She wants to help. I was furious. Help? You're bleeding her dry. Olivia smirked and chimed in. If she's willing, why not? Besides, what's it to you? I couldn't take it anymore. I had to talk to mom alone. Mom, you can't keep giving them money. They're using you. Mom just shook her head. I can't abandon them, Kelly, especially not Jerry. I tried to reason with her but they're not even trying to be responsible. Scott's not looking for a job, and Olivia's just spending your money like water. Mom looked away, her voice barely a whisper. I know, Kelly, but they're my children. I have to help them. I felt helpless, watching my family fall apart. Scott and Olivia were like leeches, draining everything and giving nothing back. And Mom, bless her heart, was too kind to see it. I didn't know how much more I could take. The breaking point was near, and I feared what would happen when we finally reached it. Things took a turn for the worse when mom suddenly fell ill. It happened so fast. One day she was her usual self, and the next she was bedridden, looking frail and weak. I was at her bedside, holding her hand. Mom, you're going to get through this, I whispered, trying to sound more hopeful than I felt. She gave me a tired smile. I'm just worn out, Kelly. I've lived a good life. Scott and Olivia were nowhere to be seen, probably out spending more of mom's money. I couldn't hide my anger anymore. Where are they, mom? Why aren't they here helping? Mom's eyes were sad. 
They have their own lives, Kelly, don't be too hard on them. But I couldn't let it go. Their own lives, they're living off you, Mom, and now when you need them the most, they're absent. Mom just sighed. It broke my heart to see her like this, defeated and alone. Then, the inevitable happened. Mom passed away quietly one night, with me by her side. Scott and Olivia were out, probably having the time of their lives, oblivious to the tragedy unfolding at home. The funeral was a blur. I remember seeing Scott and Olivia arrive at the funeral, looking like they were going to a party instead of mourning a loss. Olivia's dress was too short and flashy, even for a funeral. People were whispering, and Larry squeezed my hand, trying to comfort me. After the service, Scott pulled me aside. Kelly, we need to talk about Mom's will. I was still in shock from losing Mom. Now? Can't this wait, Scott? He was insistent. No, it can't. I know she left the house to me. We need to sort this out. I couldn't believe his audacity. Scott, Mom just died. Can't you show a little respect? But Scott was relentless. This is important, Kelly. I'm her son. I deserve it. The day after the funeral, I went to Mom's house to start sorting through her things. When I got there, Olivia answered the door with a smug look. What do you want, Kelly? She sneered. I was taken aback. I came to collect some of Mom's things. Olivia laughed, a cold, harsh sound. Oh, you didn't hear. This is our house now. Scott got everything. Scott appeared behind her, grinning. Yeah, Kelly, Mom changed her will. The house, the money, it's all mine. I felt a surge of anger and disbelief. You're lying. Mom would never do that. Scott shrugged. Believe what you want, but the will is clear. This is my house now. I stood there on the doorstep of the house I grew up in, feeling like a stranger. The realization hit me hard. Not only had I lost my mother, but now I was losing my childhood home to my greedy brother and his manipulative wife. As I walked away, I knew this wasn't the end. I had to fight back for mom, for my family, and for what was right. But little did I know, the battle ahead would be tougher than anything I'd faced before. I was a bundle of nerves as I walked into the notary's office. The whole situation felt like a bad dream. Losing mom was hard enough, but fighting with Scott over her will was something I never imagined. The notary, Mr. Richard, was an old family friend. He looked up as I entered, his face somber. Kelly, I'm sorry for your loss. Let's get straight to the matter at hand. I nodded, trying to steady my voice. Mr. Richard, Scott says mom left everything to him. That can't be true. Mr. Richard shuffled some papers. Well, let's see what the will says. Scott and Olivia walked in just then, all smugness and arrogance. Olivia gave me a triumphant smirk. Ready to lose, Kelly? I ignored her and focused on Mr. Richard. He cleared his throat and began reading the will. My heart was pounding in my chest and to my son Scott, I leave. I braced myself for the worst, the sum of $4,000. Scott's face fell. What? That's it. Mr. Richard continued, and to my daughter Kelly, I leave the family home and the remainder of my estate. I couldn't believe it. Relief and disbelief washed over me. Olivia was furious. That's impossible. She promised us the house. Mr. Richard looked at them sternly. There's more. It appears your mother made this last will a month ago, after expressing concerns about undue pressure from certain family members. Scott was red with anger. This is, she wanted me to have the house. I couldn't help but feel a sense of justice. Mom knew what you were doing, Scott. She knew you were using her. Scott turned to me, his eyes blazing. You did this. You turned her against me. Olivia chimed in, her voice shrill. We'll contest this. We'll get a lawyer. Mr. Richard raised an eyebrow. You're free to do so, but be aware if it's found that there was any coercion involved in the previous will. There could be legal consequences. Scott and Olivia looked at each other, their confidence wavering. I stood up, feeling stronger than I had in months. Mom saw through your greed. She made sure her last wishes were respected. 
Scott stormed out, cursing under his breath, with Olivia trailing behind him. I stayed back, thanking Mr. Richard. As I left the office, I felt a mix of emotions. Sadness for losing mom, relief that her last wishes were honored, and a lingering anger at Scott and Olivia's audacity. It was a regular afternoon when Scott stormed into the house, his face red with anger and disbelief. Two hundred thousand for you, and just a measly four grand for me? How is that fair, Kelly? I was sorting through some of mom's papers, but his outburst made me pause. Scott, that's what mom decided. You know she always had her reasons. He slammed his hand on the table, making me jump. Reasons? What reasons could she possibly have to screw me over like this? I took a deep breath, trying to keep my cool. Maybe because you and Olivia have been bleeding her dry for years. Scott's face contorted with rage. That's not fair. We deserve that money. That's when I found it, tucked away in a drawer, a letter from mom. Her handwriting was unmistakable. I pulled it out and started reading. Scott's eyes were fixed on me, a mix of curiosity and fear. What's that? It's from mom. I set my voice steady. She explains everything here. The letter laid it out clearly. Mom had originally set aside $200,000 each for Scott and me, but as Scott and Olivia kept asking for money, she started deducting from his share. I looked up at Scott, his face shocked. By the time she wrote her last will, you'd already taken $96,000, Scott. There was only $4,000 left. Scott staggered back as if he'd been hit. No, that can't be true. I felt a surge of anger. It's all here, Scott. Every cent you and Olivia took came out of your inheritance. He looked lost, his eyes darting around the room. But I didn't know. That's the problem, Scott. You never knew or cared to know. I snapped, my patience wearing thin. He slumped into a chair, burying his face in his hands. What have I done, Kelly? I put the letter down, feeling a mix of pity and frustration. You only got yourself to blame, Scott. You chose this path. Scott left the house that day a broken man. I watched him go, feeling a sense of justice, but also a deep sadness. Our family was torn apart not just by grief, but by greed and ignorance. The house, once a battleground of family feuds, was now eerily quiet. Scott and Olivia had left, cutting off all contact with me. It was both a relief and a curse, leaving me to deal with the aftermath of their chaos. As I sat in the living room, staring at the walls that had witnessed so much, my friend Nancy called. Kelly, have you heard about Scott? I braced myself. No, what now? She hesitated. He's been spotted around town, looking for jobs. And Olivia? She's been seen with different men, flaunting around like she's single. My heart sank. And Jerry, their son? No sign of him, Kelly. It's like they've forgotten they have a child. I slammed my fist on the table, fury boiling inside me. They're irresponsible and selfish. They don't deserve a child. Nancy tried to calm me. Kelly, maybe there's something you can do. Her words sparked an idea. You're right, I'll fight for Jerry. He shouldn't suffer because of them. The next day, I met with a lawyer, a no-nonsense woman named Miss Michelle. I explained everything, my voice trembling with determination. So, you want to pursue custody of your nephew? Miss Michelle asked, her eyes sharp. I nodded firmly. Yes. He's in a toxic environment. I want to give him a better life. Miss Michelle leaned forward. It won't be easy, Kelly, but if you're ready to fight, I'm with you. I felt a surge of determination. I'm ready, whatever it takes. The legal battle that followed was tough. Scott and Olivia were unpredictable, sometimes cooperative, sometimes hostile, but I didn't back down. One evening, after a particularly hard day in court, Larry wrapped his arms around me. You're doing the right thing, Kelly. It's hard but right. I leaned into his embrace, exhausted but hopeful. I just want Jerry to be safe, to have a family that cares. The day the judge granted me temporary custody of Jerry was bittersweet. He was a sweet boy, 
confused and scared, but he slowly opened up to us. Lauren and Eric adored him, and he brought a new kind of joy into our home. Scott's reaction was a mix of anger and defeat. You've taken everything from me, Kelly. I faced him, my voice steady. I'm protecting Jerry, something you should have done. As Scott stormed off, I realized our relationship might never be repaired. But this wasn't about us, it was about a little boy who needed a stable home. Life with Jerry was a new adventure. There were challenges, of course, but also laughter and love. He was becoming a part of our family, and I was determined to make it permanent. Looking back, I knew I'd made the right decision. It was time for new beginnings for all of us, a chance to heal, grow, and build a future filled with love and stability. That was the legacy I wanted to leave a stark contrast to the selfishness and greed that had once threatened to tear us apart. The house, once a reminder of family discord, was now filled with laughter and the pitter-patter of little feet. Jerry had become a part of our lives, his presence a constant source of joy and wonder. One evening, as we were tucking him into bed, he looked up at me with those big innocent eyes. Aunt Kelly, am I going to stay here forever? I smoothed his hair, my heart swelling. Yes, Jerry, you're part of our family now. He smiled, his tiny hand gripping mine. I like it here. Lauren and Eric are fun. I kissed his forehead. We love having you here, sweetie. I walked out of his room. Larry was waiting with a proud smile on his face. He's really settling in, isn't he? I nodded, feeling accomplished. He is. We're giving him the life he deserves. The next day, I received a call from Miss Michelle. Kelly, it's official. The court has granted you full custody of Jerry. I nearly dropped the phone, tears of happiness welling up. Thank you, Miss Michelle. Thank you for everything. After hanging up, I shared the news with the family. Lauren and Eric cheered, hugging Jerry in a group embrace. Even Larry had tears in his eyes. We're a family, Larry said, his voice choked with emotion. A real, complete family. The journey had been long and full of challenges, but we had come out stronger. I thought about Scott and Olivia, wherever they were. I hoped they would find their way, but my focus was now on the children, our family. In the months that followed, Jerry blossomed. He was no longer the timid boy we first met. He was confident, happy, and loved. One day, while we were all in the garden, Jerry came running up to me with a dandelion in his hand. Look, Aunt Kelly, I made a wish. I crouched down to his level. And what did you wish for? He grinned, his eyes sparkling. I wished we'd all be together forever. I hugged him tight. That's the best wish, Jerry, and it's come true. As I looked around at my family, I felt a deep sense of peace. We had weathered the storm and emerged stronger. Our future was filled with hope, love, and the promise of new beginnings. This was our story, a testament to the strength of family and the power of love. It was a future of hope, and we were ready to embrace it with open arms. After returning from a week-long international trip, I was pleasantly surprised when my mother-in-law, Linda, called me with an air of victory. She mentioned something about a $30,000 windfall we had apparently saved. Confused, I tried to recall any recent instance where I had amassed such a sum. As a freelance jewelry designer, I do maintain a savings account for unexpected expenses, but I certainly don't keep large amounts of cash around, and my bank card was securely with me. Normally, no one else has access to withdraw such a substantial amount from my account. You gave it to me, so I took it from the sideboard drawer. You guys are doing well, so it's fine, Linda declared over the phone, leaving me bewildered. Before I could understand more, she quickly thanked me and hinted at counting on me for future financial help before hanging up. I was left puzzled about the missing $30,000 until Kevin, my husband, returned home and cleared up the confusion it was a misunderstanding. However, a month later, Linda bombarded me with numerous calls. I chose to ignore them initially, but the constant ringing eventually compelled me to answer. 
Over 60 missed calls displayed on my phone screen was disconcerting. As I picked up, Linda's shrill voice filled the room, accusing me of ignoring her. Her tone suggested she felt wronged, but to me, it was merely the consequences of her assumptions. My life is Mary, a 35-year, busy freelance jewelry designer, wanting children but overwhelmed by work, is shared with my equally busy husband, Kevin. He originally had a corporate job, but now assists me in managing my growing design business. Early in our marriage, my designing gigs were sparse, and we largely depended on Kevin's steady income. Now, as my business flourishes, our roles and responsibilities have evolved, but so have our challenges, like dealing with unexpected family misunderstandings about money. As I neared the age of 33, my career as a jewelry designer had begun to flourish, necessitating better organization of my increasingly hectic schedule. Sensing the growing demands of my business, my husband Kevin, who was well-placed in his company and on track for promotion, made a bold decision. He resigned from his job to partner with me, applying his skills in management to our joint venture. Together, we secured contracts with prestigious international brands enhancing both our professional and personal lives. However, managing success came with its unique set of challenges, particularly involving Kevin's mother, Linda. Living alone in the family home, she perceived our lives through a lens of luxury and often approached us with financial requests. You all may seem to be living so lavishly, I'm jealous, she would comment. As part of my role, attending product launches and dinners with executives was routine, yet Linda saw these obligations as mere leisure. Her requests grew more personal over time. I want to throw a party for my friend soon. Can you give me some money for it? She asked on one occasion. Although it might appear that we could easily afford such expenses, maintaining our business image was costly and filled with obligations that we couldn't ignore. We weren't living in luxury. These were necessary aspects of our work. Linda, draped in envy and often sarcasm, failed to grasp the nature of our expenses. Dressed up beautifully, eating at expensive places I envy you, she'd say. Despite my repeated refusals, Kevin, being her son, would occasionally acquiesce to her demands, reasoning that a little financial help was a small price for peace. If giving her a little money keeps her quiet, then it's worth it, he'd argue, finding it simpler to appease her than to have our work disrupted. Yet, Linda's demands only escalated. Recently, she expressed a desire for a new dress for an upcoming gathering. Just the other day, Linda came over and pestered Kevin. Wouldn't a two-piece suit work? We've been asked to buy clothes before. There might be cheaper options, but what Linda wants is certainly not cheap, I explained. Her rebuttal was that it was a fancy party and she couldn't be the only one dressed in old clothes. Furthermore, she insisted on a matching bag, leaving us exasperated. To manage her frequent requests, Kevin had previously set up a credit card in Linda's name, instructing her to use it for her expenses. Initially, she overspent significantly and was cautioned by Kevin. Although he asked her to inform us before making significant purchases, she continued her extravagant spending. This pattern of financial demands has left both Kevin and I at our wit's end, trying to balance the delicate act of supporting family while maintaining the integrity and sustainability of our business. I discovered an exquisite ring and couldn't resist purchasing it, though I regret not informing you beforehand. Unfortunately, the bill was exorbitant. If spending is going to be this unrestrained, perhaps it's best to return the card. We simply cannot cover these costs. The credit card was in Linda's name, but Kevin was the one managing and paying the bills. Linda seemed to misunderstand the purpose of the credit card, treating it as if it were an unlimited resource. She didn't grasp that every purchase made would eventually need to be paid for, and since the money wasn't coming directly from her own pocket, she continued to use it freely. Recognizing the need to curb her spending, Kevin decided to set a spending limit on her card. This led to Linda storming into our home one day, frustrated and complaining, 
What the heck? I couldn't pay for my shopping the other day. Why? We explained that her excessive spending was straining our finances, which necessitated lowering her monthly limit. It's still enough, right? Kevin asked her, trying to maintain some peace. But you two are still dressing up, going to fancy places. How is what I'm doing any different? Linda protested, viewing our activities as purely recreational. That's part of our job, Linda. If that's a job, then what I'm doing isn't any different. It's unfair that only you two get to have all the fun, she argued. While it's true that our work involves attending product launches and parties in luxurious venues, these are professional obligations, not leisure activities. Despite her misconceptions, setting a spending limit on Linda's credit card seemed to have calmed the situation somewhat. Occasionally, Linda would visit and air her grievances to Kevin, but overall, life proceeded without major disruptions. As the end of the year approached, an exciting opportunity presented itself a foreign brand manufacturer approached me with a proposal to expand our business dealings by relocating our base overseas. The prospect thrilled me, as it could potentially elevate me to the ranks of top-tier designers. Kevin, ever supportive as my manager, was all for taking the leap. It's a chance we have to take, he affirmed. However, the prospect of moving abroad brought a new concern Linda. Given her past behavior, it was a legitimate worry that she might insist on joining us overseas. The idea of living internationally was appealing, yet the thought of dealing with Linda's demands in a new country was daunting. When we shared our plans to move overseas for work with Linda that weekend, she responded exactly as we predicted. I want to come too, she declared, assuming our move would be an endless vacation. Kevin tried to clarify, we're going there for work, it won't be leisurely life as you think. But Linda was skeptical. You're trying to trick me, you plan to live even more lavishly there without me watching. We're not moving there permanently. We'll come back after our work is done, I explained, trying to ease her concerns. Yet, she retorted, you're saying that, but you're planning to leave me behind, aren't you? Exhausted by this repetitive argument, Kevin and I were both weary. In an attempt to compromise, Kevin suggested, okay, we can't take you with us, but how about we pay for a week-long trip for you instead? Linda perked up at this, really, are you sure? We'll cover your flight and hotel, but you'll need to manage the rest, Kevin affirmed. Pleased, at least for the moment, Linda left our house half-happy. However, the peace was short-lived. A few days later, while Kevin was preoccupied with the overseas move arrangements, Linda dropped by unexpectedly. Hey Mary, Kevin said that, but I want to shop over there too. Can you give me some money? She asked. What about the card that Kevin gave you? I inquired, knowing she had a designated credit card for such expenses. Linda's face fell. That's the thing, Kevin finally took it away from me the other day. It appeared she had been reprimanded for overspending and anticipating the challenges of managing finances with different currency rates overseas. Kevin had confiscated the card. I don't have that kind of money on hand either. I can't give you money without Kevin's approval. Can you ask him? I suggested, knowing full well Kevin's stance. It's no use asking him, that's why I'm asking you, she pressed, raising her voice in frustration. Linda did end up going on a 10-day trip abroad, which I assumed Kevin managed to fund somehow. Upon her return, she called me, brimming with excitement. I'm back, and it was so fun. She excitedly shared tales of her sightseeing and dining adventures, though I hadn't asked, and I overbought souvenirs, couldn't fit them in my suitcase, so I had them shipped here. Can't wait for them to arrive. That's nice, I replied, trying to keep my tone neutral despite feeling a bit overwhelmed. Thanks to the money you saved up, I had a blast, she exclaimed. Saved up money? What are you talking about? I responded, puzzled and a bit alarmed, having no recollection of setting aside money for her splurge. I had set aside some savings specifically for business emergencies, all securely stored in my bank account. Therefore, 
It was baffling when Linda mentioned withdrawing a significant sum of money. You really didn't notice. You're surprisingly oblivious, she remarked. Despite her claims, I had absolutely no memory of such money. I found it in your house's sideboard drawer, she said, claiming she took $30,000. I was stunned. Why would such a large amount of cash be stashed away at home, especially not in a drawer where anyone could find it? Confused, I confronted her. I'm not sure what money you're talking about, but taking it from our house without permission is theft, even if you're family. Do you understand that? Linda's response was unsettlingly casual. That's why I'm telling you now. I used it. Consider it a post-factum report, she declared unapologetically. I have no idea about this money, but if you took it and used it without telling anyone, that's a crime. And if it was something Kevin had set aside for an important transaction, it's even more serious, I explained, trying to make sense of the situation. Despite this, there hadn't been any noticeable disruptions in our business finances during her trip. You two live so extravagantly, so why can't I have a little of that? Think of it as doing a favor for your parent. It's not a big deal, right? She rationalized, showing a sense of entitlement that was hard to comprehend. It's one thing to ask for help from your son and his wife, but this is not how you should behave after taking someone else's money, I replied, still in disbelief. I'm glad you enjoyed your trip, but I'll have to discuss this with Kevin when he returns. Kevin will understand. After all, I'm his only mother and $30,000 isn't much to him, she assumed. All right, I'll pass the message along, I said, astounded by her lack of awareness. Later that evening, when Kevin came home, he looked troubled. Mary, do you know about the money I left in the drawer? He asked urgently. Fifteen days ago, I withdrew it from my bank account, and now it's gone. Keeping such a large sum in a drawer, didn't you think it was careless? I needed cash immediately for an urgent payment. Do you know anything about it? It suddenly clicked. Linda's earlier call thanking me for the $30,000 and mentioning how much fun she had made since now. It was Kevin's money, meant for a crucial purpose. Kevin today, Linda called, thanking us for the 30 k and saying she had a blast with it. I didn't understand what she meant until now, I explained, piecing everything together. So it was Kevin's money, but what was such a large amount meant for? Hey, if it wasn't for a business payment, we've been doing bank transfers for a long time, right? Why cash all of a sudden? I questioned, trying to understand the whole scenario while dealing with the ramifications of Linda's actions. I was aware it was Kevin's money that had disappeared, but the full context was still unclear to me. Linda, it turned out, had taken the money without informing us, and I needed to understand why. What do you mean? I asked Kevin, puzzled by the situation. Kevin began to unravel the backstory. After he had reduced the credit limit on Linda's card, she started secretly borrowing money from various sources, including consumer finance cards and credit cards she had opened without our knowledge. When Kevin discovered her growing debt, he took away all her cards and withdrew cash to settle her debts directly, aiming to bypass the banking system to keep our business accounts clean and maintain trust with our partners. This was also partly a farewell gesture, as we're moving abroad and won't be around to manage such issues for her, Kevin explained. I plan to handle her debts discreetly to prevent our financial records from getting complicated. A month had passed since then, and as I was busy packing for our move, Linda's frequent calls became hard to ignore. When I finally took her call, her voice was tinged with desperation. Why aren't you answering my calls? I've called so many times, she said, almost in tears. I'm sorry, Linda, I've been caught up with the move. What's going on? I asked, trying to remain calm and give her a chance to explain her side. It's not just one thing, it's everything. They're asking for payments almost every day. It's too much, Linda confessed, her voice cracking under the strain. Have you tried contacting Kevin about this? I inquired hoping she had sought his help first. 
He seems to be blocking my calls. I can't get through to him at all. Mary, you're my only hope now. Please, help me, she pleaded. I realized then just how complex the situation had become. Linda's financial recklessness had led her into a labyrinth of debt, and now, isolated from Kevin's assistance, she was turning to me as her last resort. As we prepared to start anew in a foreign country, the challenges of dealing with Linda's financial chaos loomed large, demanding immediate attention before we could fully focus on our new beginnings. I was taken aback by Kevin's drastic approach toward his own mother. If he had used the prepared funds to directly settle Linda's debts, this distressing situation might have been avoided. Instead, Linda was now overwhelmed with collections letters and relentless calls from finance companies and consumer lenders. It was a scene reminiscent of something from a dramatic film, one I had never expected to witness in real life. I'll talk to Kevin, but I can't guarantee what he'll do. A son should help his mother in trouble, right? Please ask him for me, Linda pleaded at the end of our conversation. However, with our impending business expansion overseas, our financial resources were already stretched thin, and we couldn't afford to further assist Linda, especially given that she had misused the money meant to settle her debts. When I relayed the details of the call to Kevin upon his return home, he responded with a mixture of fatigue and resignation. I had planned to sort things out before we left, but she squandered that chance herself, he said coldly. Indeed, the money was originally earmarked to clear Linda's debts, but she had instead blown it on a lavish trip, leaving no room for excuses. As Linda's calls persisted, I followed Kevin's lead and set her number to block. Although part of me wished to help her she was, after all, Kevin's mother there was nothing I could do if he had chosen to detach from the situation. Meanwhile, the day of our move overseas was quickly approaching, and I still had a lot to pack. Amid the chaos of packing, I discovered another troubling piece of news. Linda had resorted to selling her house to manage her debts. It turned out she had concealed even more liabilities than we knew. The tonal amount was so substantial that even after selling her property, she couldn't cover it all. The thought of losing the family home where Kevin had grown up was profoundly upsetting. Hey, our family home is gone. Are you okay with that? I asked, sensing his sadness. How can I be okay? But there's nothing we can do, Kevin replied, his voice tinged with sorrow. Losing the house where he grew up must have felt like a great loss, akin to how I felt when I lost my parents' house early in life. In the midst of these complex feelings and the heavy task of packing, we had to come to terms with the fact that some situations were beyond our control and focus on our future as we prepared to start anew in a different country. The bittersweet reality of losing a family home struck me deeply as I observed the situation unfolding with Kevin. Unlike my past experiences, Kevin had not only lost the tangible structure where his earliest memories were formed, but also his emotional sanctuary, all while his mother, Linda, is still alive. It's an indescribable feeling, the mixture of loss and displacement, especially caused under such painful circumstances. The impact is profound and complex, far more than mere bricks and mortar. It's about losing a part of one's history and the comfort of a place to return to that no longer exists. Linda, now residing in a modest apartment, faces the daily grind of managing her debts. She works part-time, a reality that is challenging given her age. Employment opportunities for the elderly are not just limited, they're often physically demanding and less rewarding. This stark new reality for her is a drastic shift from her previous life, believed to be filled with unchecked spending and financial freedom. Though sympathy naturally arises seeing her struggle, it's tempered by the knowledge that her situation is the direct result of her own financial imprudence. Life teaches us that actions have consequences, and Linda's case reaffirms the harsh truth that financial responsibility is crucial at any age. Back in our new environment, the business is thriving beyond our initial expectations. 
The move overseas has catapulted our brand into the international spotlight, bringing in a flurry of inquiries and offers from various corners of the globe. Every new email and call brings potential for expansion and collaboration, which is incredibly exciting but also immensely demanding. The success is exhilarating, however, it envelops our entire lives, leaving little room for anything else. Days blend into nights as we navigate time zones and cultural nuances, striving to make the most of this golden opportunity. Despite the professional achievements, our personal lives bear the weight of our relentless schedules. The dream of expanding our family seems more like a distant vision, something we hope to circle back to when the waves of immediate demand subside. Kevin, who juggles multiple roles from logistics to client management, feels this strain acutely. As partners in both life and business, we find ourselves pondering the future and our priorities, wondering how we can align our professional goals with our personal desires. As I look out of our apartment window, taking in the view of the foreign cityscape, the neon lights blur into the night, mirroring the blur of our daily lives. It's a view filled with promise and anonymity, a stark contrast to the familiar streets we once knew. This city, vibrant and relentless, is now our home, yet it starkly contrasts with the quiet, steady life we left behind. The complexity of our new life is exciting but also daunting, filled with endless tasks and decisions that challenge us at every turn. Navigating this new chapter, I often find myself reflecting on Linda's situation, and the broader implications of our familial and financial decisions. It's a continuous learning curve, understanding how deeply intertwined our choices are with the fabric of our lives. Each decision, each sacrifice, and each success shapes not just our immediate circumstances, but also the legacy we leave behind. As we build this new phase of our life, we remain mindful of the delicate balance between achieving success and maintaining the relationships that define who we are beyond our business achievements.